So um, the slides will also be here as well, but I guess they will also get posted to the meetup. Um, well. uh, yeah. Hopefully that link takes you to the slides. Not a guarantee. Okay, so yeah, I'm Holden. I prefer pronouns are she or her. I'm a developer advocate at Google. Um, I'm on the Spark PMC. Uh, that means that I can make changes to Spark um, without having to other people approve of them in advance. Uh, it also means that when I commit changes to Spark, it's my own damn fault. Um, and so that's both good and bad. I don't, I don't have other people to blame for my mistakes anymore. Uh, I'm a co-author of two books on Spark, uh, Learning Spark and High Performance Spark. Uh, the second one has uh, almost nothing in Python, but I got a much better deal on the royalties. Uh, so I think it's a much better book. <laughs> uh, you can follow me on Twitter if you are so inclined. Um, if anyone's excited about open source, I do live streamed open source code reviews. Uh, it is slightly cooler than it sounds, but not that much cooler. Um, and if you have feedback on this talk, I, I always like feedback. This is cool. In addition to who I am professionally, I'm trans, queer, Canadian. I live in America on a work visa that expires pretty soon. It's a really exciting time to live in America on a work visa um, and, and part of the other community. And this is not related to a Peppy Spark directly. Um, but I think for those of us who are building cool machine learning tools uh, or data tools, it's important that we have diverse teams building these tools so that we don't just make the same mistakes that we have before faster. Um, and, you know, if you, uh, this also applies to open source projects like Spark. Uh, and so if you are in an open source project, you maybe started with your friends and you look around and it's all still your friends, maybe now's a good time to, to get some other people involved in the project too. Okay. I'm going to talk about what Spark is. Actually, how many people here know what Spark is? Yay! Okay, and for the rest of you, that's going to be awesome. We're going to talk about what it is, too. Uh, we're going to talk about what Kubernetes is uh, and why it's cool. Um, the coolness is questionable. Uh, same thing with Spark. Uh, we'll talk about why you might want to use Kubernetes instead of Yarn. Uh, Yarn is pretty old school at this point and much less cooler than Kubernetes. Uh, we'll talk about how it looks like it's going to be really simple to switch cluster managers if you're currently using Spark on Yarn. Uh, it looks like it would be pretty easy to start using Spark on Kubernetes, but I'll tell you why that's a lie. Um, and we're running low on time, and I'm also tired, uh, and also I don't have the keyboard in front of me. So I have some links to recorded demos um, that if anyone's interested in seeing, you can see PySpark running on Kubernetes um, in a few different use cases. And then I'm going to try and convince you to help me with a workshop that I have to do next week with Trevor, who's hiding something. Where did Trevor go? Okay, Trevor's not watching me. He's sitting behind this pole. So that's fine. <laughs> um, and we'll, we'll try and trick you into doing this. Okay. So for those of you who aren't familiar with what Spark is, it's a distributed system. Um, specifically, it's a data parallel distributed system. So uh, it, it does its parallelization by splitting up your data and splitting up the work on the data. It has APIs in Python. It also has APIs in other languages as well. Um, it has two different core abstractions, uh, because why do one thing right when you can do two things wrong? Um, it's faster than Hadoop MapReduce, which is a really low bar. Um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> like, and there's a, I'm not saying that Hadoop MapReduce is bad. It's just slow. Right? And there's nothing wrong with slow and steady, right? Sometimes slow and steady runs the race as opposed to uh, 15 very fast out of memory exceptions. Um, and generally, you, you want to use Spark when your problems are getting too big for a single machine. Um, there are people who use Spark on literally kilobytes of data. Um, it's probably not worth your time uh, unless you're just trying to put it on your resume to get another job, which is totally fine. No, no, no judgment. Um, so why do people come to Spark? Uh, their MapReduce job is going to take 16 hours, and they're like, well, the Spark book doesn't look that thick. I bet I can read it uh, before my MapReduce job finishes. And sometimes this is true. Um, I know people who have learned Spark while waiting for their MapReduce jobs to finish. Uh, cool. And the other one is, my data frame doesn't fit in memory on my MacBook Pro anymore. Um, thank you, Apple, for not giving them too much memory. Uh, and so then you think the solution to this is a distributed system. Um, it is not. But this is what a lot of people think, right? Um, I, I mean, you can solve this problem with a distributed system. You can also just solve this problem by getting a bigger computer 
probably one that is not a laptop. Um, and yeah, okay, cool. So Spark is a whole bunch of different things, and this is part of what has led to the magical success of Spark. Uh, there's this core layer of sort of data parallel distributed processing, but then on top of it, there's a whole bunch of different tools which are part of Spark. There is a uh, machine learning library. Actually, there's two machine learning libraries. Uh, there's two different graph libraries uh, with a third one in the works. A, uh, two different streaming APIs with four different streaming engines. So much fun. I don't know if people laugh at that. <laughs> okay, whatever. Uh, four different ways to do streaming in Spark, but, but two APIs. Um, and then a SQL-like engine. Um, and that one's really useful. Uh, it's also called the data frame data set uh, APIs. And, and for those of you who are used to using pandas, I ask you to lower your expectations. Um, Spark data frames are not pandas data frames. If you want that, what you actually want is this tool called Dask, uh, which is really amazing and made by other people. <laughs> <laughs> and and it's, it's really great. Um, it's, it's just not Spark, and it doesn't integrate nicely into the rest of the big data Hadoop ecosystem. But if you just want to distribute a data frame, you probably want to check out Dask. OK, cool. So let's talk about what PySpark is. It's the Python interface to Spark. Uh, we, Spark is written in Scala, which runs on top of the JVM. Um, Python does technically run on top of the JVM, but very few people like it that way. Uh, so PySpark does not depend on that. Instead, we use a combination of unit sockets, uh, pipes, regular sockets, and something else as well. I don't remember. But we use a lot of different ways of shuffling data back and forth between Python and the JVM. Uh, the nice thing about this, though, is you're not restricted to, like, um, Jython. Does anyone here really love Jython? OK. Right, so that was the right call. Um, it's, it's a it has some serious performance hurdles. But it turns out that you can solve most of these performance hurdles by buying more computers. And as someone who works at a company which rents computers by the hour, um, I, I think that solution is great. Uh, so you can, it'll be slow, but you just buy a lot of computers and it'll be fine. Um, and it also supports a whole bunch of other languages. They more or less all follow this common pattern of terribleness. Okay, this is a big data talk. I am required by licensing, restrict, uh, licensing <laughs> reasons to include a word count example. Um, and, and word count is actually not the worst introduction to, to a big data system because it, it has like, this is distributed computing, and then this is distributed computing, which requires the computers to talk to each other. Like the first parts, they don't have to talk to each other. These are all just transformations which could run on a single computer if we just split up our work. But since we want to combine things with the same key, the computers are going to have to work together. And then we save the results out and, and something actually happens. Okay. Um, if you don't know PySpark, uh, this is not enough for you to go and succeed and make PySpark jobs. But this is hopefully enough to give you an idea as to what PySpark kind of looks like. Um, and, and hopefully that's cool. Uh, and then you should buy my books to learn mm -hmm. PySpark. <laughs> okay, right. this is our very fine architecture diagram. Uh, we have this sort of driver program, and then we have a whole bunch of workers. And it's, it's 1 through K. And these can actually be dynamically configured um, so that you can have different number of workers depending on how much data you're processing or doesn't have to be set. So now we're going to put it on top of Kubernetes. <laughs> Kubernetes. How many people here are new to Kubernetes? Yay, so many people. This is exciting. I spent most of my time talking about Kubernetes. And this is a picture that I took at a conference of a bunch of containers. And it's a joke, because these are shipping containers, and Kubernetes uses Docker containers, which are sadly nowhere near as cool as this. But I found out these things cost like $4,000, and Docker containers are free. So we're good. Okay. So it's a new open source cluster manager. Um, costs less than $4,000. Very exciting. And it runs programs inside of Linux containers. Um, if you're not super familiar with containers, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about what they give us. And the, the right. Um, and there's a whole bunch of people who are working on it. Lots of contributors, lots of commits. Um, and that's because it's the new cool thing that all of the cloud providers are totally doing. Uh, and also people are trying to sell hybrid solutions. Um, everyone wants to sell you a Kubernetes cluster. Uh, although you can also run your own for free. So that's a great business model. 
Uh, so it's a new, I mean, new in quotation marks, like it's been around for years, but no one's been using it. Um, so it's a new open source cluster manager. It's vaguely based on some of the stuff from Google. It's, uh, well, it comes out of Google, but it's vaguely based on Google's learning with Borg, um, which is an internal cluster manager. I, I should say our internal cluster manager. I checked my email, I haven't been fired yet. <laughs> okay, that animation, All right. It runs programs inside of your containers. And, and Containers and so Kubernetes is responsible for sort of scheduling our containers. Um, you can actually use different. You don't have to use Docker containers. You could use different container mechanisms to wrap up and isolate your programs. Okay. So what is the isolation provided by a container? Um, so it gives us a lightweight virtual file system. Uh, this is really useful because um, when you have a whole bunch of different computers. Uh, on a network, keeping them all sort of in sync is kind of annoying, um, especially if you have like these things called dependencies, right? You want to use this jar, well, sorry, not jar. I spend too much time with the Java people, my apologies. <laughs> um, you want to use this really cool package from PyPy, and so you install it on all the nodes, and it's cool, but then when someone from IT adds another few, you know, nodes to the machine, and they forget to install your, your new special PyPy package, and now your job fails on like 10% of the machines, and you don't know why. But the nice thing about this is uh, you've got this lightweight virtual file system, which is going to contain all of your dependencies. And it doesn't matter what's installed on the host machine, you're isolated from that. Um, we also get a unique virtual IP address. This is convenient when you're like needing to do things with particular ports. Um, it's not super important for Spark, though, because we're able to do magic uh, behind them. Um, so we also get uh, memory and CPU memory limiting and CPU throttling. Um, this is really important when you are not the only person on your cluster. Um, very few people are lucky enough to be the only person on their cluster. If you are, it's, it's great. You can turn these off and have fun. Um, but you know, there's a good chance that other people want to share the resources with you, and you probably don't want them to allocate all of the memory on the machine that you're both scheduled to run on. That would be kind of annoying. Um, and you can also like share CPU spaces. Um, we can do a whole bunch of stuff for secrets and security. Um, we can just also skip that. We don't have to. Yay. Uh, we'll talk about the security later. Um, and there's a whole bunch of other things that we can also do with configuration, which you hopefully don't have to open up, because uh, if you do, it is terrible. Uh, it's all YAML files. Self-documenting YAML files, the best kind. <laughs> Okay, so this is this is the thing that we, we get with Kubernetes um, compared to Yarn uh, for Python people is that Spark alone isn't enough, right? Normally, Python people like Python because of the libraries, right? We want to do cool things with Spark. We want to use Scikit-Learn. We want to use uh, Spacey. We want to use TensorFlow. We want to use other things. And the problem is they're not installed on the cluster. Um, and even if they were, right, like you can go and pay a bunch of money to Anaconda to get a managed Conda environment on your like CDH cluster, but now you all have to agree on what version is going to be installed on your CDH cluster. And I find that getting people to agree about what version of software packages they're going to use is, uh, I look forward to someone achieving success. Um, I have not, right? And so this is, this is nice. Um, because I don't have to deal with shared conda environments, and if I have to deal with shared conda environments, I just end up having like 200 conda environments, none of which I know what they're doing or if they're even using anymore, right? So with this, I don't, I don't have to support that. So here's our fancy architecture. We have node one, oh sorry, A, and node B, and we have, oh I guess, numbers for the pods, pod one, two, and three. Um, and yeah, they have IP addresses, they're little happy containers, they sit on this node. And what's really cool is if this node like needs to go away, maybe it got tired, um, <laughs> more likely someone unplugged the rack by accident, um, you know, this pod, uh, sorry, Kubernetes will just be like, ooh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna schedule this over here in this other node that um, I forgot to draw. Um, but we could pretend that there's node C here and the pod will just magically get rescheduled, and my job will totally keep running. Yes. Okay. Ah, uh, yes. So we there's the isolation. <coughs> Each of these pods represents the isolation. Our nodes don't have to be the same size, but it's probably 
better if they are. Um, you can have nodes which have certain resources on them, like GPUs or TPUs. Uh, scheduling that gets kind of complicated. <coughs> you probably want to pay someone for support at that point, uh, but that's okay. Okay, so how well does this work? So the exciting news is there are integration tests, and they do run, and I know at least one person using this in production, um, which is better than some things. Uh, so since Spark 2.3, um, people have been working on making this better. Uh, we currently have Spark 2.4 out, and people are now working on Spark 3, also known as time to break all of our APIs. Um, Kerberos support is in there, but then we looked at it and we realized that maybe we didn't do a great job uh, because it doesn't uh, refresh tickets very well. And if you don't know what that means, you never want to learn. Trust me on this one. Um, learning Kerberos is the worst thing that can happen. Well, that's not true. That's not true. There's also maintaining a Perl script written by someone else, but it's not very, it's not very fun. Um, we're doing some really large refactors because that's always reassuring when you're picking a system run to run on top of. Uh, so we're changing the scheduler drastically. Yay! Um, but the exciting thing here is we can, we can do cool things uh, with the scheduler with the new like, <coughs> cluster APIs, which in addition to allowing us to like schedule pods on existing nodes, we can ask Kubernetes uh, to change its shape uh, of sort of the nodes that it has underneath the hood. Um, and that's really cool. It doesn't work, but like it's really cool, and it's totally probably going to work, because uh, I have to give a talk about that next month. So I really hope it works by then. Um, OK, cool. So, so how does how does So Spark Core goes ahead, and it asks the Kubernetes backend to schedule its things. Um, it'll ask for new executors. When it's finished doing things, it'll tell Kubernetes, hey, I don't need as many workers as I used to. You can get rid of them for me. Uh, and then Kubernetes will schedule all of these things on my cluster for me. And everything will be happy. And my jobs will totally succeed. OK, right, here's an example. We have our driver pod and our executor pod. And we, we have different, we can have multiple Spark applications uh, running on the same set of nodes, right? Um, so that's convenient. You could already get that with Yarn, mind you, but it's, it's nice that we didn't lose that. Um, and so in theory, if you want to go home and try this today, because you make bad life choices like I do, uh, what you do is you, you look at your Spark submit, and you replace dash dash master Yarn with dash dash master ks colon slash slash, a really long string from your cloud provider goes here. Um, and so this will point to your Kubernetes cluster, and in theory, everything is just going to work. Now, probably should have put this on the second slide. Does anyone think it's just going to work? No. no. Yeah, OK, well, it's not much of a surprise, because I already put the in practice part there. But yeah, in practice, uh, it's not going to work. So you have to do a bunch of work. You have to make your container images with your dependencies. Now, this is easier than convincing a sysadmin to go install your Python dependencies on every node on the cluster, because you can do it yourself without talking to someone. So that's, that's a win, um, unless you're the sysadmin. In which case, it's also a win, because there's less people talking to you. Either way, <laughs> this is a win, right? Um, possibly change your storage. So uh, Spark on Yarn, you have this thing called the Hadoop file system. It's really cool. Uh, we, don't, we don't have that anymore. Uh, so it's OK, though, uh, because you can use object stores. Yay! The only problem is object stores don't have exactly the same guarantees as HDFS, so you can get, um, uh, well, you can get race conditions that will only really show up in production. Uh, and those are the best kind of race conditions to have, and uh, super great. So that's a, that's a great thing to change. And then also after you after you go ahead and switch this over, you're probably going to end up running on nodes with very different properties. So um, wait, how many people have used Spark in production? Okay, keep your hands up if you didn't have to tune it. Cool. Uh, that's zero out of five. Not a great sample. But uh, you're going to get to redo all of your tuning work. Yay! I hope you charge by the hour. Um, I don't know. But if you haven't done tuning work yet, it's okay, because you'll, you'll just have to tune it once. So that'd be great. 
Okay, I have a word count demo. We're not gonna we're not gonna click on this link because I don't have a mouse. Um, but also, it's a word count demo. Uh, I have another demo: word counting in client mode. And uh, client mode is this fancy one where what happens is all of my executors get scheduled, but my like main driver program still runs locally on my laptop, uh, which is really useful for debugging. Um, not super useful in practice, uh, but so you can go and click on this link. That didn't work. Okay, moving on. Uh, demo number three, word count in a notebook. Yes, everyone loves notebooks. Okay, good. Um, oh, right, yes, except operations QA and you're very stressed out data engineers. But it's okay. Um, they're hopefully not here to throw tomatoes at me. Uh, but there's a recorded demo of how to deploy notebooks for Spark on top of Kubernetes as well. And so you can go and click that link and watch that demo. It's, it's about as scintillating as word count can be. Okay, so what do we need to do next? A whole bunch of stuff. Um, so Spark sort of supports dynamic scaling uh, on Kubernetes. The only problem is right now, we don't super support scale down. So we can add more executives, that, that part, yeah. The only problem is when you when you like get through the big part of your job to the small part of your job, we just keep them there. We're like, well, you know, whatever, it's fine. Um, and so to fix that, we need to fix this thing called the shuffle service. And it's more or less, we have to write a bunch of code so that we don't throw away all of your work when we uh, reduce the number of nodes. Because we store the data locally on alongside the nodes in the default configuration right now. And with the shuffle service, we won't store the data alongside the nodes that we're gonna kill. We'll store it somewhere else, which will hopefully not die. Um, and there is there is a shuffle service for Spark and Kubernetes. It just doesn't work very well. Um, you, like, you don't wanna use it. Uh, right, someone should fix the Kerberos integration. That person should not be me. But if you like Kerberos, you should click here. Uh, to learn more about the exciting ways you too can contribute to the Spark projects and fix our Kerberos integration. <laughs> if I get someone to do this, I don't have to do it. Um, very uh, and we can also fix our documentation. Um, and actually, I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm joking here, it's more um, Alon doesn't have to do it, uh, but Alon is someone who has my email address, uh, so better if someone else was busy, because Alon asks questions. Okay. So yeah, uh, we could also do other really cool things with like block migrations um, and other smart things. Uh, essentially, in addition to not storing the files next to the executor um, that we were going to kill, maybe even if we did store some of the files there anyways, we could copy them because sometimes you get 60 seconds and 60 seconds notice that you're going to die, and then you can just copy a whole bunch of data really quickly and hope that works. Uh, that sounds like a, not a great idea, but a fun project. Um, so I'm working on that. I don't think it's going to be very useful, but I think it's going to be very entertaining, uh, which is how I choose my projects right now, because I don't have real customers. OK, if this sounded not terrible, here are the resources required for you to go and do this. Is there anyone that's going to go and do this? Ah, oh, damn it. Well, I won't mention this part of the talk to my, oh wait, no, my boss can't see the audience. Uh, yes, many people are indeed interested. <laughs> uh, okay, so I, I understand. Um, you probably don't want to deploy PySpark on Kubernetes today. It is going to be painful, but I think in Spark 3, uh, which is going to be the next version of Spark, um, Spark on Kubernetes is probably going to be the best way to deploy Spark. Not a guarantee, uh, and of course, whichever solution my company tries to sell you is the best way. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I, I, think, I think Spark 3 is going to be a lot better on Kubernetes. Okay. So, now we come to the unrelated part of the talk, where I try and convince you, fine people, to uh, help us debug a workshop before I teach it on Tuesday. Or is it Wednesday, Trevor? Do you know which uh, day we're teaching the workshop? Tuesday. Oh, shit. Okay. Yeah. So if anyone here is excited about machine learning on top of Kubernetes, uh, come and talk to Trevor or myself, and uh, we can teach you-ish how to use uh, this thing called Kubeflow uh, to do machine learning on top of Kubernetes. 
It's also free software. Um, it supports Spark, except not in any meaningful way. Um, uh, Spark support is indeed merged into master, however, it's not part of any release, and as far as I can tell, the tests do not currently pass. Uh, but they will really soon, uh, probably. Uh, I'm going to try and work on it this weekend. Uh, or go and eat more ham. Uh, oh, wait, here are some books on Spark. If anyone wants to work with Spark, not on top of Kubernetes, uh, these books are all great because uh, none of them talk about Spark on Kubernetes. Because uh, the publishing cycle is a lot slower than the software cycle. But let's focus on my book. Specifically, <laughs> the one where I make more money. Uh, it has nothing on any of the things I've talked about today, but that should not stop you from buying it. Uh, you can buy it from Amazon, uh, or really anyone. I don't, I don't care. I don't buy it used. I don't get any money if you buy it used. Uh, buy a new copy. Okay. Right. <laughs> so, if you know children who want to learn about the magic of distributed computing, <laughs> I am working on a book called Distributed Computing for Kids, <laughs> with the number four. Um, and, and unlike everything else in this talk, it's not actually a joke. Um, <laughs> uh, if you go and give me your email address, uh, I promise to contact you in compliance with European regulations. Um, because I, the IP address is not recorded, but it records that you're from Europe, so I don't spam you that much. Um, but I'll, I'll let you know when distributed computing for kids with Apache Spark is available. Um, it's currently in an early draft form. Um, the, the most feedback that I've gotten is that the gnomes look a little too creepy. So, uh, we're gonna rework the gnomes and also uh, probably make the example slightly more exciting than what I've got right now. Uh, but definitely give me your email addresses and you can teach children the magic of distributed computing. Uh, I, I, that's a good use of time, right? Okay. Uh, I'm gonna be in a bunch of places. If you wanna come join me at any of them, they're in other places. Uh, oh wait, we'll actually be back here, right, Trevor? Yeah. 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 KubeCon. We'll be back here for KubeCon, if anyone wants to come to KubeCon, which is a conference about Kubernetes. Um, and we'll be talking about how to do machine learning on top of Kubernetes with Kubeflow, uh, which we sincerely hope works by, um, oh wait, this is being recorded. It already works today. <laughs> <laughs> Great, we're done. Uh, I mean, I think, we're running a little short on time today, so maybe it's a great time for me to not take any questions. Uh, but if anyone wants to come talk to me afterwards, I have a dress that has unicorns on it, and you can come and find me and I'll, I'll answer your questions one on one. That's where we can finish on time. Yeah. Happiness!